It's crazy the way some things have changed. Years ago, I didn't talk to guys like this, cops, prosecutors, but there was always honor, trust, and respect until there wasn't. And then came the betrayal. After that, me and hundreds of others, wise guys, flipped. Fuck going to jail. I walked away from John Gotti and the life. On the other side, it was a different world. This was the real trust and loyalty. They wanted nothing but the truth in return from me. Of course, testifying in court, but that didn't change the fact that these were the good guys. At times, they reminded me of my mother and my father, and I knew it was the time to change my life. I owed it to my bloodline, and I owed it to the Gravano family, generations after me. One thing that still bothers me to this day, they blame me for the Frankie the Chico car bombing. Another lie. This sit down is different. This time I'm getting the real truth from one of the good guys. He's a real heavyweight in law enforcement. Heard he's been face to face with some of the worst evils in the world. And today he's going to tell me the real story about who was involved with the bombing. He was the guy who interviewed Gas Pipe and others when they cooperated, and a whole lot more. Come with me to this meeting. Hear it for yourself. Hi, Michael. Uh, Sammy over here. We're about to do this, you know, meeting. It was long in the making. I talked with Tommy Day and uh, know a little bit about you. I heard of you years ago, but... Uh, now we're finally sitting down and having a little chat, you know. Looking you, forward to it. I'm looking yeah, forward to it. Yeah, me too. You're doing some great work. I know you're doing a few books. It's a few yeah. books that I'm interested in. You know, I know you did uh, with Tommy, you did the book Mob uh, Cops. Uh, yeah, Friends of the Family, right. And I'd be very interested in talking about, you know, a lot of the things you are talking about, this uh, child case parts and you know, a lot of this stuff that you're aware sure. of, I'd love to hear about that stuff. Sure, sure. I know that um, when uh, when I got a message from your from Anna, we uh, she'd mentioned the um, the case that I that I ended my other book with Crooked Brooklyn, uh, which was the case involving a dentist who um, who was basically who was stealing body parts um, wow. from uh, from cadavers. Yeah, that's what I said when I heard about it. Yeah. And, um, you know, I Sam, I've been I've been around a long time and uh, and I had seen a lot of things and I had done a lot of things. I had never seen or heard of anything um, as as horrible and horrific as this. And um, and, and you know, when when the prosecutor who first learned about it came to me uh, let me take you back into how we how we got this the, uh, um there was a there was a, a, a company uh, uh, that owned many funeral homes around the country and they bought a funeral home um, in Bensonhurst and um and when the owner the new owner went to the funeral home to to look at it and to examine it after the purchase had been completed she stumbled on a room on the second floor of the of the funeral home and she walked in and in in there were were two guys who were essentially <laughs> to her it looked like they were operating on a cadaver on a on a on a on a dead person. What they were doing is they were slicing open his legs and arms and whatever else they could do to steal bones out of this body. Their 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 boss, this guy Michael Mastro Marino, who was this defrocked dentist, um, had cut a deal with funeral directors all over the tri-state area, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. And, uh, and this was one of the funeral homes that he had, he had cut a deal with. And the deal was this. When someone died, the funeral director would tip off Master Marino that he had a fresh body coming into the funeral home. And, uh, and Master Marino would then send his people to do what this woman saw them doing, which was to take the bone and tissue and whatever else they could, they could harvest out of the body for the purpose of then reselling it to companies, mainly in the South, in the in the southern part of the United States, who were processing these bones, etc., for use by reg by doctors and by dentists. So, if you've ever had a dental implant, 
if you need, if you, if the dentist says that you don't have enough bone in order to hold the implant um, f forever, then you have to have a bone transplant. And what they do is they cut a piece of the bone and they knit the bone knits, so it goes into the jaw, and um, and it knits. And when it's knitted and it's now uh, settled in there, then they can put the dental implant in. So right. this this is what this is what this dentist was doing. This was his business. And um, and when he lost his license, which he did because he was addicted to to Demerol, um, and and when he was operating one day on, <laughs> on someone's mouth, he actually fell asleep in the middle of the operation, and that was the first. That was one of many violations that he had had things that he had done as a dentist, and he lost his license. Now the guy was making a lot of money, Sam. A lot of money, and he was living. He lived in a mansion in Fort Lee, New Jersey. He um, he had he, he lived very high. You know, he had a very uh, uh, I guess a, a the kind of life that a millionaire lives because he was a millionaire and he was making money from all of his dental procedures. Now that was gone. He was going to lose all of that. So he had to figure out a way to continue to continue to make money and to uphold his lifestyle. And he knew about, you know, the bone transplant and the bone. But but he also knew that there wasn't many, many, there wasn't much of that around. People weren't people weren't giving anybody permission to take the bone and tissue out of their loved one's body before they were buried or before they were cremated. That just wasn't happening. So there was a shortage of, of bone and tissue for transplant. He recognized that and he started to try to get permission from families to do this legitimately. He got nothing. He got zero. So what he did was he fell, he fell back on this procedure of bribing these funeral directors into tipping them off to the to dead bodies. And he would send his people to the funeral home and um, and they would they would ravage the body. Now the question that everybody asks me when I tell them this is, well, would the family know that when they laid the body out? Because, you know, it, it, it would look emaciated. It would look, you know, like it would, it would not have any, you know, any substance to it. Well, they knew that as well. They mean the bad guys. So what they would do is they bought PVC pipe and they would substitute the bone that they had taken out in the legs and in the arms with PVC pipe, sewed it back up, and then it would look like the arm would be, you know, would be like a regular arm. The other thing they did is when they didn't have enough PVC pipe, this is this is this really my was my bowl blowing for me, is that they would take whatever garbage they had, like their lunch papers or leftover food or whatever it was that they had, and they'd stuff it into the into the, the body, and then they would sew up the body so that it would have substance to it. That's what was happening. When this woman bought this funeral home, she went over and asked them what they were doing. And one of the guys was very honest. He said, we're, you know, we're harvesting bone. Now, she didn't think anything of it. She had no, no clue that this was being done without family's permission. Um, and, uh, and she went over and she touched the arm of, of this cadaver. And it was very, very squishy. They hadn't put the pipe in there yet. So she, it stuck in her mind and she remembered that. So the, the sale went through and when she went, got to look at the books of funeral home, she realized that the owner had, had stiffed her for about 300 grand in prepaid funeral expenses. And that's why she went to the police, not because of the bone stealing, because she didn't have any idea that this was something that they were doing illegally. So they, the police... She went to a detective in a local precinct, and the detectives don't know anything about this kind of stuff. So they came to the DA's office, and they sat down with one of my prosecutors in the Rackets Division, and um, and he listened, and he walked into my office one afternoon, and he said, Mike, I got to tell you what I have. And he tells me about this woman, what she saw, and the 300 grand that she was missing. He said, but this is what she found them doing. They were stealing bone and tissue out of, out of, out of people's bodies. So he said to me, what do you want me to do? You want me to investigate the 300 grand that was missing or the body, you know, the body, the, uh, the body parts uh, theft? And I said, listen, Josh, let's forget about the 300 grand. We'll worry about that 
another time. Let's do the investigation into the body parts. Right. And we, we started and we started and we found since we will, we were limited to Brooklyn, obviously we found a thousand cases in Brooklyn, Sam, a thousand where they had taken body parts out of cadavers and sold the, um, and sold the, the parts to processing companies for use later on in people's bodies, live people like you. If you needed a, a bone transplant, you would get a bone from one of these processing companies, and it more than likely was had come from Mastro Marino's operation. Now, the other problem was is that Mastro Marino, nobody gave him permission, so he was doing it, you know, just illegally, as I said before, on the QT, but he didn't care what the person died of. If they died of HIV or hepatitis or some other communicable disease, he didn't care. He just he took the body anyway. He took the bone anyway, which was horrific because if you transplant that bone into someone later, whatever is in the marrow could very well flourish again and give the person the the disease that that person had that died right. that died of. The other problem is that he was taking bone from people who were from men and women who were in their nineties. Now, could you imagine if you needed a bone transplant for your leg and bone was from somebody who was 90, 90, 95 years old? I mean, that's obviously not the kind of bone that you want. So how did he get away with that? He would he forged death certificates. And he had, for the most part, the death certificate read under the cause of death that it was a car accident. A person died in a car accident. Whereas... Most of the time, they died of some communicable disease. And the other thing he did was that he forged the, the signatures of family members on permission slips. Now, why did he need them? He needed the permission slip. He needed the death certificate. And he needed the sample, obviously, of the bone or whatever. And along with that, he had to send a test tube filled with the blood of the cadaver. Okay, that so that processing company would have all of this in front of them so that they could they could figure out whether or not this is something that they should accept now how did he get around the the um the the blood what he did was he would steal blood from certain cadavers that he knew did not have any communicable diseases so let's say he had a body that he was working on and they did die of a car accident well he would make sure that he stole as much blood as he could kept the test tubes and then he would label them with the name of the bad of the the you know the 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 person who had a bone or tissue that was not you know not very good. And he would send all of this stuff down to the processing companies, and they didn't know anything. Uh, they were not the wiser. Um, when we broke this, the FDA, the federal the Food and Drug Administration, issued a nationwide recall. You know, you used to recall cars when something's wrong. Right. This was a recall of body parts, essentially. What they said was they set it out, sent it out and said anyone, anybody who had a bone transplant had to go to their doctor to find out where the doctor purchased the the bone from. And if it was a, a, one of these companies that Mastro Marino was, was doing business with, they were told that they had to go back to the doctor on a regular basis to be tested for, let's say, HIV or for hepatitis, and um, and it caused it was it was unbelievable what what uproar occurred as a result of this. And believe it or not, Sam, there was one person that I'm aware of, and I'm sure that there were more, who actually contracted the disease. And I don't remember if it was um, if it was hepatitis or I forgot what disease it was. She con she contracted the disease from the um, you know from getting the bone transplant. What year was this? And this was in this was about mid two thousands. It was probably around two thousand eight seven eight. That that I that we got them. He was doing this well before that, and he was doing it in he was doing it in New, in, in in the five boroughs. Oh. He was he was doing it in Rochester, New York. Philadelphia, and he had he had teams in each of these places. The other thing we found out is that he had cut a deal with a prison in Russia so that when a Russian prisoner died, he would get tipped off. He'd send his people to pick the body up. They would bring it to Germany, and then they would do what 
they were doing in that Bensonhurst funeral home, taking the blood, the the body parts. Wow. The other thing that he had done, and this never got off the ground for him because we got him before that, is he had cut a deal with a Jewish nursing home, an old age home on the west side of Manhattan. And the deal was that they were going to tip him off to everybody who died in a nursing home that he was going to have at the bodies before they were buried or cremated. You know, so it's crazy. When, I, you know, back then I had implants put in and I got some bone transplant. And the weirdest thing is that, you know, after that, a year after that, I think I started talking Russian a little bit and I started wearing a yarmulke. So I think uh, <laughs> I better check out what I got. <laughs> you better check it out. Absolutely. Check Absolutely. It out. <laughs> well, let me tell you, let me tell you what, um, you know, what karma really kind of played a role here at some point. At the end, when, when he went, he, he pled guilty. He, um, you know, yeah. he finally had, uh, you know, he got religion and, um, and he realized that what he had done to all of the families and one, one, one little sideline, Sammy, when this case was on the calendar, every time it was on the calendar, the courtroom was filled with family members of the, the people I, who were, yeah, sure. who were, who were, who were, you know, the victims of, of this course. thing. Of course. And, um, and when he went, so he, I remember when he was sentenced, he turned around and he made a statement to the, sorry, you know, I'm sorry I did this. You know, he really was in his mind. He think I guess that he thought that um, he was going to solve everything by just simply saying, I'm sorry. They weren't, they weren't, didn't want to, didn't want to hear it. They just, you know, they, they wanted, they wanted blood. Judge right. gave him 54 years, 54 years. So he went in, he went into jail. He was in prison about uh, two years later. I get someone comes into the office in my office and said, Mike, I got some information about Mastro Marino. I said, what? He's in jail. She said he died. And guess what he died from? Bone cancer. Wow. So that is, yeah, that that's, to me was the ultimate karma. karma. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Karma. Absolutely. I, um, no, I, I, just, gotta... I just read an article. I, I know I do a lot of things about the open border, about drugs coming across the border. And I, you know, yeah. I read up yeah. on a lot of the articles. I was reading an article not too long ago that a car got stopped and uh, this guy or something was holding a baby and there was a bottle in the mouth, a nipple in the mouth, and uh, like they were feeding the baby. But the dog that they walked to the car with got really strange, jumping up, barking and growling. And so they stopped and they looking at it. it. The baby was dead. They cut the baby open and they put all the drugs in the baby's body, you know, sewed it up, put a little, you know, in a, in a blanket. Yeah, yeah. And they were smuggling the drugs across in a dead baby's body. Yeah. Now, yeah. did they kill the body? the kid before who knows but i mean these acts are, are, are beyond imaginable H horrific Even, horrific. I mean, horrific i mean no matter how much of a criminal you are or whatever part of life you're in they're, they're horrific i mean these are things that uh, you need a lot to shock me but these things with your story what you're telling me is unbelievable it's unreal you know it sounds like a good horror movie oh yeah absolutely you know, absolutely it's amazing absolutely. Uh, amazing I, i'm I'm thinking about what I'm going to do is it's part, it's the last chapter actually in that, in a book I did called Crooked Brooklyn, as I said before, but I'm going to, I'm thinking about expanding and doing a lot more research and maybe doing a, a book, an entire book on, on the subject, because there is a, um, you know, stealing body parts is not something that was new there. It, it, back in ancient times, um, people used to steal bodies so that doctors could learn about the you know, about the, the body and, and how it worked and the position of, of organs and things of that nature. So there were a lot of there were a lot of thieves, body thieves who raided cemeteries to take take bodies to study and, and, and things of that nature. But when you contrast it with a guy like Maestro Marino, who was basically doing this for money, nothing else, just for money and didn't give a damn about the families and what he was doing to the families. Um, it, it boggles your mind that somebody could do that. Let me, let me just tell you one last thing about this. I, I had to go, I got a call one time to go down and, and uh, be interviewed for a TV show on Mastro Marino, about Mastro Marino's, um, the name of it was, uh, I Married a Monster, I think was the name of the show. 
and and the subject was Master Marino's wife and and Master Marino and what he put her through, etc. So I walk into this this studio and it was in a, the back of an old building in Manhattan and it was really a kind of a, a, a dingy looking place and and I walk in and there's a woman sitting there and she said um, so I say hello to her and she looks up at me and she says you're Mike Vecchione right I said yeah why how do you know that she said I'm Barbara Mastro Marino I am oh. Mastro Marino's husband uh, wife. I'm now known as she changed her name to Barbara Mastro. And she said to me, I said, listen, you know, I know it was horrific. I'm sorry about what he did to you. And I'm sorry that, you know, this whole thing had to happen to you. She said, you know what, Mike? Shouldn't be sorry. She says, I'm happy that you did it because you opened up my eyes to the monster that I was married to. She's claimed that she had no idea what the source of, of their money was. And, um, you know, Sam, I had no reason to doubt her. Maybe she didn't. Um, and, you know, the other thing about him was that he had he was also a womanizer, too. He had girlfriends all in all different kinds of places. And one of them was someone who he, he taught how to open up the bodies and steal the and steal the bones. And he got her hooked on Demerol as well. And she got locked up in Philadelphia. And um, and it was a it was a horrific situation. I mean, just horrific. Everybody who was touched by the case um was was, was you know was damaged absolutely had damaged right. it was um, um but let's not horrific. let's not do too much negativity on being a womanizer because uh we could do that on another show um, I oh think yeah, yeah 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 i no, think I i'm guilty a little bit i I, <laughs> <laughs> I only raise it because of of you know of for the fact that mrs master marino had no idea yeah, about yeah. anything of that yeah. her husband was doing you know right. that's that's why I, that's why I raised it. So, um, so you know, you touched on one other thing, and I and I have to raise this with you. You touched about the, the border and and trafficking of of bodies and trafficking of drugs. And you know, when I was in rackets, I started the first state prosecutors unit of sex tra a sex trafficking unit, and I had several assistant DAs dedicated to to sex trafficking and. When we oh, when we started this, people said, "Well, what kind of sex trafficking is there in Brooklyn?" I mean, come on, that's crazy. Well, I got to tell you, Sam, it was um, what you've told me about this. You know, the way that they smuggle this 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 body across the, uh, the the border with the with the drugs that doesn't doesn't surprise me in the least. And I'll tell you why: because we found in many different areas of Brooklyn women who had been trafficked. And in some areas and in some places, they would they were they could have been your daughter or my daughter. They it, so it wasn't only international trafficking. These guys who were the pimps and were the heads of these these sex trafficking local sex trafficking units would recruit women who were let's say online at CVS buying you know buying uh, you know cosmetics or buying something, and they would talk to them and. And they seem to have the ability to to figure out who had a broken home or who was unhappy at home, you know, that kind of thing, because that's who they 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 really were able to to touch, um, you know, touch a chord with. Right. Them. Right. And, and, and the kids. So so in addition to we did do international and I'll tell you that in a second. But in addition to that, there were kids and these were girls these were young girls who were trafficked who were recruited and promised all kinds of things money and jewelry and and um you know and a place to live and and you don't have to listen to your parents any longer you know you stay with me etc and one group believe it or not was called the horse gang one of these sex trafficking units in brooklyn the horse gang and i said to the prosecutor who had the case, she said, what, what's the deal with this name, the horse gang? She said, Mike, it's because they say that they have a stable, a stable of women who they traffic throughout the borough, throughout the city, throughout, you know, throughout the area. They are, they, and, and we, and, and they would, they would also look for, if they had one of, let's say one of their friend, one of these women had a friend who they would, interview, they would talk to the woman. And if she told them, that she had a friend who was in the same kind of situation as she would. Well, then she would set up a meeting and they would wrap this woman up into the, uh, into the, into their, their, their stable, so to speak. Right. Um, and it, and I, I there, we, we had gotten so much information about this once we started 
fact, we did a we did a promo, and um, I had Sarah, Sarah Jessica Parker, and um, and a, and another actress, uh, Gabare Sidibe, uh, an African American actress who was in a, a movie called Perfect, and um, and she and I and Sarah Jessica Parker did a promo for the sex trafficking unit. And we put out the, the we, we did this, you know, maybe it was a two minute, three minute thing. And then we put the, the, the number out, the hotline number, which we established. Sammy, I got to tell you, the hotline number was jumping off the hook after we, after we did that. People were, you know, yeah. we got parents calling about my kid is missing or my kid was, is, is strange and has been acting strange, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, and it was, it really opened up, really opened up my eyes and, um, let me tell, I'll tell you one, one quick story. They, we got message from, I guess it was uh, NBC News was doing a story on um, two trafficked women from the from Eastern Europe. I think they were either Russian or um, or from Czechoslovakia. I don't I don't remember, but it was Eastern Europe. And they said, um, you know, we're going. They, the two women escaped and were in Atlantic City. And NBC News went down to interview them because they were going to use them as part of this, this show. And they tipped us off. They said, you know, we'll be there Wednesday night, for instance. You guys come down on uh, Thursday morning, and we'll, we'll, they'll be there, and you can, you can talk to them. Because they opened up to NBC News. Well, NBC told them that we were going down there on Thursday. And when we got there on Thursday morning, they were gone. They were gone. They were so frightened of yeah. having and and law enforcement, you know, in Russia, law enforcement is, is is bad. I mean, there are a lot of bad parts of it here too. But in Russia, you know, if you have the government coming after you, that's that's a real problem. So they couldn't distinguish. They didn't see us as being people who could help them. They they saw us as people maybe who could cause more problems for them. Um, and one of the other things that that we found that that these guys did, whether they were local whether they were more international, they would immediately take the, the passport of these, these young women, immediately. As soon as they, were, they got them into the apartment where they were going to put them up and give them money and give them dr uh, uh, drugs, give them jewelry, whatever, they took their passport. Because so I had a woman who was another Eastern European, she had come to the United States and um, not trafficked, she, she, she was grabbed here in this country and, and brought into this this unit yeah. um i forgot the name of it and, you know, and I, she, I, I did a little research on the border and i've been doing research on right. the drugs coming in all kinds of things popping up now that a lot of these people you know the women they'll take their kids across and they make a deal with them in other words oh, we'll yeah. get you in we know somebody's going to pick you up on the other side we know what state you're going to be in we know what name you're going to be using and we'll get back to us. You owe us X dollars. Absolutely. And when we get back to you, you're going to work. Work, and they're pimping them off. So Absolutely. That's how they're paying off their debts and stuff like that. And now they'll, you know, they'll, if they don't pay and they don't do the right thing, they'll kill them. They know that. Absolutely. These, you know, we, these are smart women. They're broke. They, they, they're used to the violence. So they know this is not just an idle threat. So they're doing that as well. And they're no also question. opening up small little cartels of men all over the United States. So when they come in, they don't come in with drugs, but they go to a state, let's say they go to Ohio, and uh, they set up a little crew, people that are coming in. So when they smuggle the drugs in, now they get in touch with him. They go right to Ohio with the all and stuff like that. What bothers me a lot you're an honest guy and you're an honest cop and an honest prosecutor and uh, you're dumbfounded with some of this stuff, which is uh, amazing to me. And uh, and you're a good man, obviously. But the government knows this is going on. If, no I question. Could know, if I could know it, I'm sealed over here in Arizona. I know it's going on. I'm hearing it from people, um, even some Mexican people who are good people come across. I know some Mexican people and they're telling me about it. I won't reveal their names or anything like that, but they're telling me about it. And uh, so I said, listen, there's very little I could do. I know I got a show. I'll talk about it a little bit. And uh, so, and that's what I'm trying to do is open people's eyes. But I, I know the government, the news media, it's open. I, what kills me is that 
How is it not being stopped? Why are they not closing the border? Why are they not stopping this? Giving it some I, sort of a try to stop it. I, I have the same question, Sam. I, I, I look at this and, and, I, and I read a lot of this and I do watch various shows not only one side of the uh, you know of the of the the issue but as much as i can gather you know and get into uh, right. into reading and and i say the same thing because a lot of what i read about you know hits home because we were finding the you know the results of that which are the women who had who had escaped because they couldn't come to us if they were still part of it they would they had escaped and they and there were various ways that they were able to escape sometimes these guys would trust them and they would say, okay, you go out and do what you have to do and then come back. And and instead of that, they would make a call and they, and, and they would go to either to the cops or call us on the right. hotline and we would go pick them up. The um we we one particular instance about this is we get we got a tip about a, a massage parlor in Sunset Park. And um and the massage parlor was was basically a whorehouse. I mean that's that's what it was. And and it was manned by Asian women. This was an Asian an Asian uh, sex trafficking, um, not Asian sex trafficking group, but the people who were trafficked were 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 Asian women. And what she what this woman told me, and I interviewed her myself, is that they would get when they first got to the United States, they were told that they were going to have this big job ready for them. These women, some of them were professionals. Yeah. And and when they got here, they were sent to, you know, to hovels, these places to live and maybe six, seven, eight people to a room. And and then every morning they would have to report downstairs, wherever they were, onto a bus. And they drove them into Sunset Park in Brooklyn. And then the women get off the bus and at the curb, Sam, at the curb, when they got off, they would gather, let's say five or six of them. They would say, okay, you go with that person and they take them off. Those people were going to, let's say, restaurants. Then you go, then another group, you go with those, that guy. That They were going to the sweatshops, you know, this right. so close in Sunset Park. Then there was another group and the woman I, I talked to was with this group. She was going to the whorehouse and she worked out of work all day. And, and I said to her, how many, how many tricks did you turn every day? She said, in the morning, sometimes, you know, 10, 12, 14. And then at, by the time I'm done at night, you know, maybe 20, 25. And she was exhausted. I said, well, what happened then? Well, they would take us back. So where did you eat? Well, they would buy us, you know, a little bit of stuff to eat. And they would get me back into, into the, uh, put me back into the, the place the next day. She said, if I got lucky, I would get sent to the restaurant. Or if I got lucky, I'd right. get sent to the to the sweatshop. And the point of it is exactly what you're saying. She had to pay off the people who uh, who brought her who into brought the her. country. Right. And yeah, and they were terrified. If they were to skip out, they were terrified because back home, the bad guys knew where the family was and what they would do to the family. So it's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. And I wish I had the answer to your question about why the government isn't doing something about it. I have no clue. Yeah. I just, it you know, is, I it's just, I just got another thing and I was reading, a guy gave it to me and showed me an article. You know, it, it, when I opened it up, it was, it's not an article. It's more like a, a little book mm -hmm. inside it. There was all very pretty women and stuff like that. And I said, what's this? He said, those are women from Ukraine right now, present day. Their, their, their families were killed. They, they're, they're alone. They're, they're professional, some of them. They're not stupid. They're not, you know, gutter rats. They're, they're, they're regular women. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so now I could bring her in and under a visa of some sort that I'm going to marry her so she can get into this country for two years and get a citizenship and this and that and the other thing. And so I said, well, I mean, they, they can do that right on the borders. I said, no, no, this is about sex. So you would turn around, tell her this, get her in, say you're going to marry her. You, you sign some papers. Um, she comes in, she could stay here. You use her in whatever way, sexually, she's going to know that. And, uh, and then you, she can apply on her own. Maybe she meets somebody legitimately. I said, this is so bloodthirsty. I got a daughter. I got daughters. I got granddaughters. I mean, this is so, when you yeah. do something like this, you know, 
I could see guys running around. You're a little bit of a womanizer. You cheat. You do things. But I mean, this this, this is so brutal to do this to women. A young young women, you destroy it. By the time this woman is 35, 40 years old, and these were young girls, 23, 25, whatever, get, trying to get out of Ukraine. I mean, to people who take uh, advantage of human life like this, I mean, you have one way you would go after them and arrest what and arrest them. Me, I have this thinking mafioso. We, we would turn around and we would kill people like this. You don't even deserve to live. If right. This is what you're going to do. You're not even a human being anymore. Well, yep. money, money, you know, make you do some things. I mean, I've done crooked things and in my life, but I never imagined anybody coming to me. You know, I'll give you one quick story. A guy came to me, my one of my guys in my crew. And he said, Sam, he says, uh, this guy wants to pay 25000 for us to kill his wife. So I says, uh, well, tell him we want half, 12500 up front, and we'll get the, the other 12500 after it's done. He said, I thought we don't do that. I said, no, we're not. We're not going to do it. I said, we're going to take the money and we're going to rob him. <laughs> and he can go to the cops and tell them, listen, I paid 12500 for them to kill my wife. And they robbed me. They didn't do it. Let them go tell the cops that. Yeah. You know, so I'll get, yeah. I'll get arrested for robbing the money. But, you know, I'll tell this fucking bum, there's a divorce court. Exactly. You know, so I, hey. people like this just turn my stomach, you know. Uh, like I, 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 said, got, I got a daughter. Me... Every time I hear stories like this, I think of my daughter. Yes. I think of my granddaughter. And little, you know, I got a granddaughter, a little, little brat, five years old, six years old, whatever she is, running around. And I say, I mean, how do they do these things? They, what, these they, young, uh, yeah. uh, Sammy, they, were, they, they would come to us and they were, you know, they were pathetic. And, and pathetic in the sense that they had fallen for the trap of, uh, you know, I, the guy's going to give me money. He's going to give me jewelry. He's going to, you know, take, and I don't have to listen to my parents any longer until they realize what they were. Basically, right. they, were they don't know they're dumb. You know, you, you look at your parents. I don't blame these kids. I mean, I feel sorry for them because they're dumb. They think this is a way out or something like that. But yeah, and, what they're doing is destroying themselves. And it takes sometimes years to realize that and so on and so forth. Especially what? when you get to the youth, young kids, 18, 20, 21, whatever. They're too young to really understand you know, it looks good. Now they got all kinds of things, uh, uh, PayPal's or friends. TikTok. Or TikTok, things TikTok like that. TikTok is you one know, of I those places. At it, you know, the, the, the young girls are just, you know, gorgeous. They're bouncing around half naked. I mean, yeah. uh, but I, I guess that's the time and age. It's, it's not as disgusting as the other stuff. But um, the whole thing, our morals and everything, you know, I heard a speech with... Uh, by uh, Putin, President Putin. And he was talking about the United States and how we lost our morals and, we, you know, and yeah. we're, you know, we're, we lost our compass in life and we're self-destructing. And that's the thing, you know, with freedom of speech, we're losing all different kinds of things. I talked to my friend, Michael Francis, you know who he is, Michael yeah, Francis. And we talk on occasion, we talk like this, you know, like we're talking and we don't film it, but we're talking about it. And, and, and we're like, you know, it, it's hard to believe that two gangsters could sit down and say, what the hell is going on? But it's true. Well, you know, we got, he's got seven kids. He's got a bunch of daughters. And we talk about this stuff. It's, it's crazy. Sam, there, there, there does come a point in your life, and it came for you, where you said, you know, enough is enough. I have to go a different way. Yeah. And um, and you did. You know, you did. And you should be proud of yourself for, for going a different way. And and Fred CZ, the same way. You know, I mean, it. there comes a point, as I said, where you say, you know, this is I, I recognize that what I was doing is not the right way to live. And I got to live a different way. And, and, and you have, you know, and you... Yeah. You, you made it. You made it in terms of you made it out. And and I sometimes it would seem to me the hardest part is to stay out, you know, is to, to make sure that you don't fall back into right. into uh, into that problem, uh, into the way it used to be. But right. I, I don't see it with you. I think that you're going to be you know, you'll you'll be OK with this. And um, and it's it's something which you should be very proud of. Yeah, I, 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 I got out the first time out of prison. I did five years and then I bunked into, you know, 
some bullshit. Uh, I forgot yeah. what they called them, pills or uh, uh, ecstasy. Ecstasy, yeah. And I gave them a little money. I really wasn't involved. And uh, I got sucked into it. My name, all this bullshit. They hyped it up. And uh, and I got a 20-year sentence. And uh, that really woke me up altogether. And I won't go near nothing. I tell people, I tell my accountant, I says, listen, when you do taxes, there's a, a line. And, you know, gets a gray area. Don't even go near the line. Even yeah, if I yeah, yeah, pay yeah. a little extra in taxes, don't. He says, Sammy, I wouldn't go near the line anyway. You know, so I'm, I I want to make sure I don't do nothing wrong whatsoever in life. And I changed my life. I, I talked to some kids about, you know, they, you know, some kids talk to me and I get parents talk to me. I talk to their kids sometimes. And, uh, you know, I don't know how to say, like, nice things to him. You know, don't do this, don't do that, because they'll call me a hypocrite. So I tell them, listen, you want to be me? You want to be Sammy the Bull? You want to be a gangster? Good. I got 22 years in prison. You're going to kill your friends or they're going to kill you. I was exactly. shot twice, stabbed once. Yeah, good good luck. Check off. Go ahead. Do it. Enjoy it because that's your life. That's what's going to happen to you. So, exactly. ahead, you know, if you want to be a gangster, go ahead. And I saw a black guy who did the same thing as I did. He was in a jail cell and he was talking to people just like we are. And he says, listen, bro, hey, be a gangster, deal drugs, a lot of money. You don't have to pay tax. You don't have to do nothing. But I'm going to see you over here. You're coming here with me. <laughs> yeah, no question about it. He's in the jail cell. So that's hard love. You're selling hard love. That's the yep. way to do it. Because the reality is that's what's going to happen to you. You're going to screw up your life. You're going to screw up your family's life. You're going to screw up everything. Look, so, there was a TV. They did a, whole, they did a whole TV show about it. It was called Scared Straight, right? And they yeah. would have people who would, who would sit with these and, and and I have a friend, I have a guy that I represented when I was doing defense work who um, who who was charged with a murder. And um, and it was the worst case you could possibly imagine in terms of from the prosecution's point of view. It was two junkies who were who were the witnesses. And and, and it was it was terrible. And, and it was during the time, however, when there were so many murders in Brooklyn that, you know, anybody who was who was charged with murder. For the most part, unless there was no case, right. the jury was going to find him guilty. Right. And so this, but this one particularly irked me because the one of the witnesses who was in this in this apartment where this infant incident occurred, she was on the witness stand, and I said to her, "Do you see the guy who pulled the trigger? Is he here in the courtroom with you?" Because I knew what her answer was going to be. And she looked around, she looked at my client, and she said, "No, he's not here." Jury still convicted this guy. It's amazing to me. He did 33 years, Sam. Yeah. And yeah. he wrote me, he wrote me all the time. He and and he's now out. And um and he's been trying to, you know, to get this his his conviction overturned. We've gone through all kinds of things to to do it. I've I've signed affidavits, I've testified, I've done all kinds of things. And the DA's office was wrong. They were wrong. They they should have turned and the other thing they didn't do is they didn't tell me that that there were two guys who had been arrested for the murder before my guy was arrested. And they let them go. And those were the two murderers, by the way. Yeah. And um, my point is that this guy now spends a lot of time talking to people in his, he's an African-American guy and he was, he was brought, it was raised in, in the Canarsie projects. And he now spends time talking to kids, just like you said, you know, in terms of, of trying to people send their kids to him. They sit, you know, maybe on a bench in a park and he talks to them and to, to do exactly what you're talking about in terms of scaring them straight or straightening them out because there's only yeah. one place that they've got two places, jail or the grave. That's where, right. you know, it's going to, where they're going to wind up. And so, I'm doing, uh, working on things with prison reform and stuff like that. You know, I had a, I was in the ADX Supermax for a, you know, yeah, I did about six and a half years in the hole. Um, and I was bounced around, but I did some time in the ADX Supermax. And the warden got in touch with me, retired, got in touch with me, sent me a letter. And I'm going to do something with him, a little conversation. I'm talking about prison reform. I'm looking to get good. some people together. And uh, I'm working on that, too. You know, it's not everybody's got to get out. But there's, you know, laws, the, the RICO law is a tough law to beat. You know, yep. I would, a lot of guys in prison would come over, especially a couple of black guys, friends of mine, come over. Sammy, what about this case? See if you could take a plea. Why? I don't think I could. No, 
I said, listen, you're going to go, you're going to, you don't have money, right? No. Well, you're going to get a court ordered, you know, attorney and yeah. not, not the best attorney in the world. And you're going to get some, uh, ex cop drunken Irish guy. Who's your investigator? Not the best investigator in the world. Think about the government. Now they're going to have four or five top guys like yourself who are smart attorneys. You're going to get the FBI as the investigators for them. You think you're going to win and you're going to get the max. They're going to kill you when you, when you get sentenced. So my advice to you is see if you could take a plea, reduce it down and, uh, and whatever. Yeah. You know, uh, but um, the, the the whole court system is 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 they need court, uh, prison reform, and and I did twenty two years of my life in prisons. There's never you don't be. I'm not. I was never taught anything. I was taught how to live in prison, and I was got tougher, not weaker. Yeah. You know, so you're not learning nothing. Prison reform should be out there. Sentences should be. The, lower, the biggest thing that struck me, I got out in 2017. I didn't have a fucking penny. And uh, well, I had $430. And I lived with my daughter. She allowed me to live with her. I lived with her. And I went for food stamps, Social Security. I went to get the state to pay for insurance. I couldn't get it. I was a soldier in the military, so I got the VA. And uh it's so tough when the when the housing market came up, uh, they offered her a lot of money for a house, and I said, "Take it." She said, "You're living here." I said, "I'll get it. I'll live in the office, and then I'll get an apartment." Okay, okay. So she took it. So I moved right. in the office, and I started to go look for an apartment. Now I'm still on parole. I got a lifetime supervised release, and uh, I couldn't get an apartment. First of all, the, the investigations, if it's OC, organized crime. Right away, you, you're not going to get it. Um, them, I'm Sammy the Bull on top of it. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. They said, yeah, forget it. You're not getting right. it. So I've been living in, in an office for a while. And and not, you know, I could get apartments in really low-level places in a really shit neighborhood, which I don't want to because I'll wind up getting in trouble somehow. So, uh, and I say to myself, if I didn't have family and some friends who came to me, uh, some FBI guys and some ex-cops uh, and and a little help and a good parole officer uh, be in trouble again. Yeah. So that's what right. about these people who don't have that? Exactly. They're going to exactly. come out, you know, this. then you're going to tell a guy who's a drug dealer or whatever he was dealing with five, eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a week he's making and you want him to go flip hamburgers in McDonald's for $14 an hour, $13 an hour, whatever the hell they get paid. Not going to work. No, no. And that's why there's recidivism and they, yeah. they can't vote. They can't have a gun. They can't get a place to live. I mean, you, you take, you, you're taking away too many things. There's no opportunities. There's Absolutely. Trade hey, schools me... that they could learn in, in prison, but they don't give you nothing. Well, you're going to have an opportunity if you get this uh, ex warden to, uh, you know, perhaps, what you say, if you say just what you said now, it's going to have an impact, I, I believe. I mean, I think that uh, it depends on who, who's going to listen to it. Yeah. But if it's if it goes to the right people, I think you will have an impact. I think that I really do. I mean, look, you're, you, you've you lived it. It's not like you're making this up or it's coming out of a fairy tale. No, I lived it. Yeah, no doubt about it. I lived it. What's the woman's name? Uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to reach out to Candace Owen, Owens. She's a very you know, black yeah. woman. Yes, very, very yes. smart. She's, she's into prison. I'm trying to reach her if she would come on the show with me with the warden and a few guy, maybe you, or a couple of people who really I know mean, about the life and, uh, and I love talk to. about prison reform. You know, and he said this guy was the you know the warden of the ADX. You would notice. I mean, that's the toughest prison in the country. If you're getting that job, you're a special guy. Yeah, now, he was a special guy. He really tried to do the right thing. And now when I talked to him, he said, Sammy, I was there. It's too harsh. I mean, you're better off getting sentenced to death than being in the ADX Supermax. Because it's just, you know, you've got to be punished for your crimes. No doubt about it. But this is inhumane. It's to the point that it's inhumane. And if people are comfortable with that, 
I mean, people probably don't know how. Oh, they, they, they don't. They don't. No. And listen, I, I was I was a prosecutor for 30 years, some odd 30 some odd years until I had and I had uh, Greg Scarpa with me, Gregory Scarpa, the kid, the son with me for a year talking to me about a case in which uh, involving an FBI agent. He was he, we took him out of Supermax. And when the guys who brought him in sat down with me afterwards, they said, Mike, you're not going to believe this. He didn't know. He didn't know that there were cell phones. He had no idea. He had never had a soda for for as long as I didn't know there were cell phones either. Right. I mean, I mean, he, he knew, but was, I never used it. It was like he had been on the moon and came yeah. down to Earth. And then I got to talk to him, and I and I learned about how he was in his you know in his cell for you know for twenty three out of the twenty four hours. He had an hour out, and he said, "And Mike, I didn't go out into any yard. They put me in this little other this other small room where I could just you know kind of walk around." So I, I it was it opened up. It really did open up my eyes to, you know, to what yeah. was out I was there. in there with him, you know. I was in. Oh, the, I didn't know that. I didn't I know was, that. When I was in the ADX Supermax, I was with him. Uh, and I was with um, Gas Pipe was in there, too. Yeah. At the same time. I knew we Gas Pipe. Was... Together at the right. same time. He told, me, he, he, he told me the story about how he used to communicate with Gas Pipe. I think they were on either side. And they used to talk with through using the, the toilet paper uh roll the middle of it in and use sink. it as like as like a microphone into the into the the sink yeah. so that the sinks and the pipes are connected <laughs> so you you aware of that you know my girl is listening to you right now she's laughing a little bit because i told this story before and they said what how'd you do yeah. that and, and you're saying yeah. <laughs> it's amazing so you know so it's it's, it's it walked, is it was amazing he comes into my office the first thing he says to me greg when i when, when gregory when, when we sat down he said, Mike, before I forget, you got to, Sammy, uh, not Sammy, uh, uh, Gas Pipe wants you to go see him. He wants to talk to you. So I said, I, I, okay, I'll, he, now he had, at that point, he had moved to uh, to Butner, North Carolina. He was in a prison hospital. But I said, well, how did, how did you, were you able to communicate with him while you were in jail? And he tells me the story about the the toilet paper rolls and how they, how they talk to one another. Right. And he also told me about how, he was also passing. He was in the middle of two uh, Muslim terrorists, and he was able to. They were passing information to each other through him, and he was able to. You know, he he kept and he gathered it together, and he kept it, and he 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 had used it at one point, but not to his advantage, unfortunately. Um, but he told me about that. He told me about the. Um, I said, "You kidding me?" He said, "No, that's how we were able to communicate." Yeah. So you put the thing in the in the drain. And you listen or you talk, and that's how yeah, you, you blow the water out. Right. Real good blow water, it. it blows it out, and exactly. those things are t uh, attached, and yeah. you can hear it. It's almost like a whisper, but you can hear each other. Right, right. That's what Crazy. he told me. Yeah. That's how he knew. That's how he, that's how he, he, Gas Pipe was able to tell him to have me go see him when I, and I did. I went down to, to North Carolina twice to talk to him after, um, in fact, when I walked in, I asked him if he had read Friends and the Family. <laughs> and he said, yeah, I did. I said, so? He goes, it's about 98% accurate. So there's some things in there that aren't right. You know, I said, okay, I'll take 98% at this 98 point. 98 is a good point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was good. It was Absolutely. good. It was good. So, um, so, hey, listen, I got, I, you know, you were talking about some things that you were talking about in terms of the jail. Um, also pertain to, and, and I think you, obviously have in, you have experience with this as well and that's witness protection right mm -hmm. witness protection is a I, I, the guy i wrote the, my latest book about is mm -hmm. it was a banano hitman his name was ronces folly luigi ronces folly and and for you, for your listeners the name of the book is homicide is my business and i would suggest from what i i heard from people who've read it they love the book i mean it's it's really a, an interesting story this this guy um when he ultimately decided to uh, to cooperate he was put into witness protection, and um, and you know Sam he he couldn't he couldn't live he couldn't live that way. He told me, and and I found out that he they moved them every couple of months. He was in another hotel, then he was in a motel, and he was and it was all in places like in the Midwest <laughs> where he had no connection. He got from Catania, Sicily, into Brooklyn, into New York. He was traveling around the country in L.A., Miami, to places like that. When he now he's going to all of these places that and living, trying to live in these places without any kind of job. I mean, he didn't even have a job. He depended on whatever the government was giving him. And um, at the end of the day, Sam, he killed himself. 
he 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 just couldn't um, he couldn't take it anymore. And no. you know, so yeah, when I got out, I you know the, the the government was begging me to go in because I didn't want to go in. I had money, I had family, I didn't want to go in. But they begged me. My first bid, I got five years with the nineteen murders. So they said, Sam, you're going to make the uh, the government look bad. Give, give them something. So I I agreed. I did get treated good. I, when I was with the agents, I was treated good. So I says, I'll give you another year. I'll go in. You could change my name. You could do everything. One year, and I'm out. And I did eight months in there. And it is a bitch because you you have no connection with fa your family, your friends. Absolutely. You're nothing. So it's really difficult to live that way. And everything you do, you're living a lie constantly. And how I got out of it, I met some woman in there. I'm going to get in trouble with this, but I met some woman and uh, played around a little bit. And uh, at the end, she recognized me. Something on television came out and she recognized me. So they came. They said, we got to move uh. you. Change your name again. We're going to move you. I said, no, no. I don't care if she knows. It don't matter to me. I said, uh, I'm not moving. I promised you a year. I'm in eight months already. I'm leaving. No, you got to change. I said, I'm not changing. You can't force me to stay here. So they can't. So I said, he says, then you got to sign out. Oh, good. Give me the paper. I signed out after eight months. And I went to Arizona where my family was. And I went. Right. But the pro, I don't know how you could stay in the program. I mean, See? some guys, I know some guys who are friends of mine who changed their name, started a life, started a business, um, and they lived that way. They wanted to come on and do a thing with me, but it, they didn't want to come out of the shadows. And, uh, right. You know, because right. they have a business, so if they would do something with me and it's on TV live, the people would say, oh, my God, you know who he is, really? <laughs> you know, so yeah. I understand yeah, that. I get of it. Course. But I still, you know, I talk with them occasionally and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, so, but well, the, the witness protection program is a tough nut to. Let me. It, it got so bad for Luigi, so bad that he was a cooperator. He couldn't take it, the witness protection, and at and at some point he decided that he was going to go back to the Bonanno people and and he got the lawyer on the phone and said basically I'm going to recant what I told, what I swore to in open court, just so that I am not part of this any longer and and that's what he was going to do he was going to jeopardize his freedom again because he couldn't take what he where he was and how he was living and what was happening to him fine luckily luckily for him in terms of of not going back to jail he got you know again he he, he woke up before he actually went into court and swore that he was lying the first time and um and he he basically said no 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 I, I, what I said before was was truthful and um, and he, he lucked out. They didn't charge him with perjury. Um, the conviction stood. It was the pizza connection case actually and it stood oh. and um, and he but that's how bad things were, Sam. He was yeah. willing to go he, 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 he thought about and considered going back to jail um, instead of uh, the witness protection program, which was to me I, I couldn't believe it but you know, it was that bad. But, when yeah. you know, it's really like a foreign. He, it, you're like a foreigner, really, when you think about it. And he was a foreigner. Yeah. So, I mean, this is the guy who grew up in Sicily. He comes here. He's a foreigner to begin with. But to be in a situation where you're in, let's say, the middle of Iowa. Yeah, in some right. In a motel, that's like being in, on the moon, as I said to some, to some people. You know, how do you live? He didn't know how to live there. And um, yet he um, ultimately, he. He did the right thing for himself, but then years later, he he still couldn't take it, and he wound up, as I said, committing suicide. So, yeah. because well, of, fortunately, I yeah, see uh, people here like he had nobody probably. He but had. Fortunately, he had a, I had family, I had friends, and I said, I'm not staying in this thing. You know, it's hard for us to change our ways. I changed my name. The first place I went to was uh, Houston. Then they sent me to Dallas, Texas. So I'm in Dallas, Texas, and and one of the marshals. They were pretty good guys. He says, Sammy, how come you don't come out of the hotel? Where am I going to go? I don't have a driver's license. I don't know anybody here. Where do you want me to go? So he says, we're going downtown. There's clubs and whatever and discos and all kinds of shit. He says, you want to come out with us tonight? I said, yeah, all right. So I go to this club. It's half a disco, half a club. 
and uh, it's packed. There's a line. We wait. We get in the place, and we go towards the back, and he's going to go to the bar and get some drinks. I tell him what I want. Get me a little, you know, scotch on the rocks and whatever. And I'm waiting by this door that's facing the outside. The people are on the outside, and they're online. And I'm on a door. It's like a, you could open the door a little bit. Yeah. So uh, everybody's, you know, looking at me and the guy knocks and he wants me to open the door. Right. And he puts up a five or a $10 bill. So I said, fuck it. I opened the door. That took the $10. I let him in. Right. So there was one people that I saw that everybody wanted to come in, sneak in. Right? So I'm taking money, letting the bit. So the marshal comes in, he says, what are you doing? I says, quiet, you got a piece. I'm going to let the bid, we got the door, we let the bid over here, we're going to pick up a couple <laughs> of <hours. laughs> So I had fun with it. The, the marshals, I think I had, they had a good time with me. It was almost like I was going to turn these marshals into half a gangsters. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, uh, what's that movie there? Uh, on My Bloom Heaven or something? Yeah, yeah, My Blue Heaven. That yeah, was yeah. Uh, in the Midwest. Well, Luigi <laughs> did have we had a family. He had a wife, and he had I think three daughters by that point. But they were they were in witness protection too. And he he oh. he was not near. He was not near them. He was not allowed to go near them. He never saw them again. And by the time you know that this happened, where he killed himself, they probably had um, had God knows where they were. They may have even gone back. You know, to um, to Sicily by that oh, point, Sicily, yeah. but yeah, but he had no, he had no, no family. I mean, he was literally yeah. no. My alone. family, my family didn't come in the program. And my wife, my kids, nobody changed their name or came in the program. That's why I did the wrong thing by cooperating, and I broke the rules. I I got to do that bullshit. Not them. They didn't break no rules. They didn't do anything wrong. So they didn't come in, and I stayed there like I said eight months. And as soon as I went left. I changed. My name was Jimmy Moran. They made me Irish. Yeah. <laughs> I had blonde hair. They made me an Irish guy. So my name was Jimmy Moran. And then I, when I got back, I changed my name back. Why didn't the marshal say, why do you want to change your name back? I said, my father gave me this name. He was proud of it. I'm going to die with this name. No matter if I get hit by a car or I get shot in the head, I'm, I'm dying with this name. I'm not going to yep. die. Yeah. You know, it's, well, and let me tell you why they put the, he his he he agreed and his wife agreed to go into the program because at that point when he when he started to cooperate he was test he was cooperating against a guy named Michele Sindona who was a who was a financier from Italy who had caused the fall of the Vatican Bank he had caused the fall of a bank in New York and uh, and the guy was 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 washing money for for I think it was for the Gambino family and and for and for other you know I was going to tell you Joe Piney. Joe Piney, he was uh, he was with yeah. us. I, I I don't know if you remember him. He was I do know the, the name. Yeah. He was part of the Castellano hit. He was on the Pizza Connection case. Yeah, he was yeah. involved in that, and it was the Gambino family. So, well, uh, well, the thing with with Sindona is that when Sindona got indi he got indicted in Italy, and he got indicted in the United States because he caused the fall of the 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 uh, Franklin National Bank. And and he had he he was living high on the hog, boy. Let me tell you. Um, and and what happened was when he got indicted in both places, the only way he, in his mind, the only way he could get out of this was to ki kill the prosecutor in New York and kill the judge prosecutor in Italy. And he and he went to Luigi and and gave him the contract. He said a hundred grand for the guy in New York and a hundred grand for the guy in Italy. And Luigi at that point had gotten very, very, um, he, he had lost his, his. Didn't Santona, his, Santona did, didn't he become an informant as well? Sindona? Yeah. No, no, was he, he didn't. He, who he was died. the guy in that case got poisoned on the witness stand? Sindona got poisoned, yes. Oh, that's him then. Okay, I, yeah. I know, I know the case. When, yeah. You know how they poisoned. poisoned him? I don't know if you know. They put, they, you know, you go, when you take the stand, there's a pitcher of water and you could take a yeah. drink. They poisoned the water. Oh, that I didn't. Uh, that and I didn't. when he drank from that, you know, his mouth is getting dry. He's talking, he's nervous. So he drank that and it poisoned him. And he died on the stand. Yeah. When I, I cooperated. I, I would go with the marshals and the FBI and I would tell them, give me uh, the pitcher of water. No, there's one out there. No, no, no. And I told him the story about Sindona. I said, 
Right. Get it over here. Let's wash it out and get me water from here. Bring it out with me. I'm not drinking any water laying there. Of course, when they took a break, you know, the judge goes in, everybody goes in. Somebody put the pictures laying there, a picture of water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I knew the case. Yeah. Well, because he, you know, because he turned them down, he said, no, I'm not doing the hits. He now is completely disillusioned with the uh, with the American mafia. And he, he decided that that was it. I'm going to go, you know, and go yeah. in because he wanted to save himself and he wanted to save his family, too. So that's right. what caused them to walk in. He walked into the, into a police precinct and right. he said, I want to talk to the FBI. And that's right. how that's how we. And then he ultimately came to me because I had a, I had a, I had a case at that point, an open homicide in Brooklyn that he was responsible for. He killed a guy. He killed a chef in, in a new corner restaurant. And you, you must have. You know, the new corner in, I think it was in Dyka Heights or in, in Bensonhurst. And um, an I, Italian restaurant. I heard of it. I don't remember yeah. exactly, but I know the name. Okay. Yeah. He killed a chef in there because the chef had raped, was raping his own niece. And the family, the kid's family went to the, um, uh, went to the local, whoever they, I forgot if it was, I think it was, a, they went to the Gambinos and they, they hired a guy and the guy goes to do the, do the hit at the new corner. And he and then when he pulled up, there were police cars all over the place. And he got cold feet and took off. The reason the cops were there was because they were eating in the restaurant. They were, you know, there was not anything going on, right. but he didn't go in and do it. That, that's how Luigi got hired. He went in and he did it um, and, and and killed the guy. And um, so that's the case that he had. So when the FBI had gotten everything they needed from him about Sindona, they brought him into the DA's office. Uh, I'm sorry. They gave him to the cops, and then the cops brought him into the DA's office, and then he he started to uh, to open up. He, told he, me about his yeah, kids. He et implicated the Vatican. He knew the whole connections there with yeah. the Vatican and everybody. Sindona, else. absolutely. Sindona yeah. was part of the group that poisoned John Paul the uh, John Paul the first. As right. um, so that's and so Luigi, when he turned him down, he said to me, Mike, when I when I turn him down, I know that uh, I'm dead. I'm dead. I can't go into jail because he had gotten arrested, Sam, for a little bullshit robbery in Queens. Right. And he got five hundred dollars bail put on him. And he goes to Sedona because he needs the money to get out. First of all, he robbed a woman. That's the thing that was really he, he didn't know it was a woman because she was dressed like a man. And he said to me, he said, in Sicily, we know rob no women. That was his thing. So right. he couldn't face it. And then he, he, he couldn't be couldn't go to jail, couldn't get on a witness stand, couldn't do anything. He said to Sedona. Get me out, five hundred. I'm gone because he impl he told him essentially. I know, you know, I know about you, and he he kind of, kind of hinted that that he had something on him, which he did, of course. And Sindona told him no, and he said to me, Mike, he said, I I know at that point I'm a dead man. He said because I turned down I turned down Sindona. He gets out, gets money from his brother-in-law. He gets out, and he goes to um, he goes to Sindona again, calls him and says thirty thousand. I'm out of the country. You'll never see me again. We're done. Sedona tells him no. And that was it. He walked into the precinct and said, I'm done. And I and he gave up. He gave up the uh, you know, gave up Sedona, talked to the FBI, they prosecuted him, and he got convicted um in two places, in Italy as well as in the United States. So um so that was but but his his thing about the witness protection program was startling to me in terms of but not surprising, because you could think about a guy who's you know, who's who doesn't know anything about the United States, you know, doesn't know anything, certainly about the Midwest, where, you know, a place like where well, you said you were in Houston and, and Dallas, those are two big, two big cities. But you could be sent to, you know, some little podunk town in, uh, you know, in the middle of Nebraska or something. And you, you can't. You can't well, make if, it if, after Dallas, I wound up in Colorado for the rest of the time I, okay. I left. I left from there. Well, Colorado was nice. I was in Boulder, Colorado, small little town. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. it was it was gorgeous. You know, uh, jogging trails. It's a college town. There's like four or five colleges there. Right. And right. Uh, there's all kinds of young people running around, and it, it was cool. And I was working out in prison, so when I saw all of that uh, jogging trails and all that stuff, I I, I said, you I'll look. Yeah, I was good. Good. Yeah. For a couple. Of I gotta months, tell you one. One other thing, just on the same topic with witness protection, I had a guy who was a cooperator. He was in a, pro in a program, and he was in. He was sent. He was in Minnesota. He was in. I forgot what town. Somewhere in Minnesota, and he came. He was going to testify in a trial, and he came. They brought him in, 
and he was in um, in the uh, the that little apartment that they have down below the courthouse in in right. uh, in Manhattan. In you know, yeah, yeah. So so I go in and I speak to him, and um, and he says to me, "When when am I going to be done testifying?" I said, "Well, you know, we're expecting this day, this day, whatever." He said, "I said why? Where where are you going? What do you got to do?" He says, "I he says I I I got to be back in in my town." Uh, for Friday night football, high school football. Yeah. I have a, a Frankfurter yeah. cart yeah. that I sell Franks at the football game. And he said, that's how I make money. I got to be back there to do that. And that's, he's a guy, again, witness protection. That's that's what he, uh, you know, what he yeah. was doing. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's I, not, I mean, it's not, uh, uh, you know, it was a way out. The government used it in a good way. A lot of guys flipped and, it, it was gave them an open door to get away and be in different kind of units. In Wetsec, they have Wetsec units, prison, yeah, you know, witness protection units in the country. I was in a few of them. One after I cooperated, uh, and I left the ADX. I was in one. the The first time when I went to prison, I was in it, and uh, I guess it's a. It was a. It was a good tool for the for the government and uh, no question there's the no question that it's, wanted yeah. to leave and you know it was a way to go somewhere and do no something. question no question about that that it, it's ne it was necessary to have that but um it's just that there are certain people who you know just can't uh, can't live that way you know that and yeah. it's unfortunate but they can't yeah. you know? i can't and live that i couldn't live that way i really couldn't so I left i you know i made that commitment i because i had money i had family i didn't need the program I wasn't worried. Right. You know, I'm not looking for protection. So I didn't want to go. But they did deserve, you know, I five years, I said, I'll give you another year. But I'm not, you know what I mean? I want to move around and do my thing. And and they, and they were good with me. I got to say the truth. They were fair. They were good. They were, yeah. yeah. some of the marshals and people were great. I made them a deal. I wanted certain things. Um, I was talking with... Uh, uh, ABC with Diane Sawyer. I wanted to do an interview with uh, one of their produ producers. Right. I, want, I wanted to meet with Peter Moss, who I was going to do a book with. I did the book yep. on the boss. Yep. And I wanted to be with my wife. I haven't been with her for five years. So I wanted to be with her on vacation. Give me those couple of things and I'll give you the year. And yeah. I, they did that. Now, when I was with my wife, they set up a place in... Uh, um, in California, in uh, where's the place where all the way south? It's beautiful. The weather's gorgeous. San Diego, San Diego. San Diego. Yeah. They gave me a, a beachfront thing and everything, and they really stayed out of the way, you know. To so one day, me and my wife were walking on the on the beach on the sand. So I said, "Wow, they're really giving me a little elbow room. They're never around. I don't even see them anymore." She says, "Yeah." Well, look all the way down the beach. There's two guys standing there with binoculars. So I looked. That was them. But they were a couple of hundred feet away. They were yeah. so good. It was incredible. I took her to dinner. We went to dinner. And uh, they were outside. And they were sitting by a car, a truck. I saw them. But they let us alone. So I said, they're doing, they're great. You know, they're, they're giving us a little elbow room. We could enjoy it. And the place was crowded. There was a table next to me with a guy and a woman. And she said, what happens if something happens? I said, they're right outside. The yeah. woman sitting at the next table. She said, we're right here, too. Oh. <laughs> I didn't even know them. So the Very next good. table we were going to go, we were going to the way they have the dolphins and all of that. Yeah. They were yeah. getting me the tickets. So I said, listen, you know, you all could come with me if you want. Instead, because I know you're going to sit in, so we could all sit together if you want. You know, my wife was uh, she was ordering for the people sitting in the, in, in the in the truck, right, so right, they, yeah. that we were eating and they were sitting outside. So I said, "Listen, we might as well. All right, you don't have to go. Stay away." You know. So hey, I, 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 I know what you. I, I got had a similar experience because I was never in witness protection, but I got to tell you, there was a point in my career where I, I did a homicide case. And it was a guy, and I did it with Tommy, by the way. Tommy was the detective and, and me. And we locked up a guy who was a, a, an old a cold case murder. And uh, and he was a an associate. I forgot if he was a Gambino or if it was a Lucchese. I don't remember. And um, 
And he killed his sister's boyfriend. And they did it along the Bell Parkway in Brooklyn and brought him into the woods. He shot him twice. And the guy didn't die. The guy came out, attacked the witness that we had. And then the guy, then then the 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 shooter had a had to hit him over the head with a two by four and killed him. So we try, and then and then they they tried they forgot to bring shovels. They didn't bury him. They put tires, car tires, on top of him and and made a, a pact to coming back and bury the guy. When they went back, they took the tires off, and it was all maggots and everything at the body. So they said, forget this, and they put the tires back. They didn't go back for, until years later, a year later, because they found out that there was going to be a, a shopping mall built in that area on, off the belt, and they needed to bury the body. So when they got when they got back there, it was only now a skeleton. And they took this skull, broke the skull off the spine, punched out the, tick, the teeth so that nobody could identify it, put it in a bag, and threw it into a creek in the woods. Years later, two years later, a guy's fishing in the creek, and he finds the um, he finds the skull, and nobody can identify it because we don't have the case yet. Tommy gets uh, a cooperator from a federal cooperator. They tell him he's got information about a homicide, and Tommy and I make this case. We make this case. We 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 find we we identify the skull. We find the skull. We identify the skull, and um, and the guy pleads guilty. He was smart because we had a good case against him. He had the brother of the dead guy was on tape had him on tape saying that he was with them that day. And I don't know what happened. I just dropped them off. And, you know, so we had them together. It was, it was a decent case. He gets, eight, I think he got six to 18. I was going to stand, I was had the sentence and I had a young female assistant DA working with me and she had never done anything like this before. And we went over to court and I said, listen, Karen, why don't you handle, you handle the sentence? You know, you've never done anything like this before. All she had to do was just simply, Say to the judge, we're ready for sentence and remind the judge what the set, what the plea was, was going to be. And that happened. Everything was cool. He goes, he goes back into Rikers Island. We go back to the office. I would say about a week and a half, maybe two weeks later, I get a call from a detective in my office. He calls me and he says, Mike, you better get up here. There's a guy, somebody wants to kill you. I said, holy shit. I go back, I go up and there's a guy sitting there, some mope with it. And he's in, he looked, they brought him out of Rikers Island and and he's, the detective says to him, tell this guy what you're here for or what you just told me. He said, oh, there's a guy in jail that's got a contract on a guy named Mike Vecchione. I said, well, that's me. He said, well, there's a guy in jail who wants to kill you. I said, who is it? So he tells me the name, and it's this guy, the guy with the skull case. We find out that the reason he wanted to kill me was because I had let the young woman stand up to do the sentence and he said you disrespected him by having this young woman stand up instead of you doing it yourself that was the reason why i wanted to kill me and when the da heard it i had bodyguards with me just like you were talking about in terms of people i had people if i go into a restaurant they would they would be in there with me if i went to the gym they would be in the gym with me if i went to the movies they'd be sitting behind me um and that went on for for a good period of time until we found out that the guy had gone up state but he had told Somebody who was informant of ours that contracts off. He said, "I don't need any more trouble. If I kill a prosecutor, then it's going to be more time for me in jail." So, so it would have been life. Is, what's that? It would have been a life sentence. Oh yeah, yeah. So See, now me, is, I'm totally different. Now, if you would have brought me a woman to stand up, I would have sent you a thank you letter, <laughs> <laughs> especially if she was good looking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went to a restaurant once, Sammy, and we were at the restaurant. I was at the bar, and the two detectives who were guarding me that day were two women, and they were sitting outside. So the owner comes up to me, and he said, Mike, what's what's that all about? So I tell him. So I knew that the real owner of the restaurant was Gigante, was Chin Gigante, because the right. owner the owner on paper told me that it was. So he says to me in a whisper, he says, Mike, you know, you just tell me who's involved here. He says, you know, I can take care of this for you. I can take care of all of this and you don't have to worry about it. I said, listen, Mur my guy's name was Murray. I said, Murray, it's okay. We got it. We got it under control. I, I, that's all I needed, right? Was to have more people involved in this thing. It was enough that, that, that it was, it was, it ultimately was fine, you know? Um, and, uh, and, you know, it, although I do believe, I do believe that when we did the mafia cops case, that they were behind, a uh they were behind a uh a burg the burglary of my my father's house at the time i was 
I was living with my dad. It was separated. And, um, and I got a call one day from my sister saying, come home. So what's the matter? She said, when you get home, you'll see. And I go home and uh, the whole place, my apartment was trashed, Sammy, trash that you could not believe. My father's place, not even touched. They did such damage that in the basement, there was a, it was a uh, we had a, a toilet down there, a bathroom. They stuffed it with um, toilet paper and paper towels. And whoever was in there who did it took a shit in it and then flushed the toilet. And the shit water was all over the basement, all over our basement. So I remember. And, and all my stuff was stolen, everything. I had money, I had jewelry, everything. So I, I remember calling. I told Tommy and he said, somebody knows. Because we were we were – Still, we were involved in the in the mafia cops case at that time. Now, and, as, um, as a cop, uh, l let me give you a little tip. As a cop, you could have picked that shit up, went for DNA testing, and yeah, uh, I know, I know, I know. But <laughs> you didn't do that. <laughs> well, let me tell you. Here's what the cops told me. They're they're at the, they're in the house. They're dusting, right? So I say to the guy, I said, he says to me, "Where do you want me to dust?" I said, "You're asking me." You're the cop. You dust where you think you should cop. But I, then the detective is in there from, from I would lived in Queens at the time. The detective from Queens says to me, um, he said, so, you know, tell me what you had stolen. So I tell him, well, watches and this and that. I said, so what, you know, what are you going to do? He said, well, you know, he said, what you should do is go down to Jamaica Avenue in Jamaica and look in the porn store and the porn shops and see if you see stuff. And if your stuff is there, you call us and tell us and then we'll take it from there. <laughs> I, I remember Tom, I remember calling Tommy at that point. I said, you're not going to believe what this motherfucker just said to me. He goes, he told you that? The detective said? I said, yep, that's what he told me. He, so anyway, I never got a thing back, Sam. Never. I, luckily, they missed. You know what I had that they missed? I had an envelope filled with cash hidden in, in my – because I was just about to pay for my son's high school tuition. And I hadn't gone to the bank yet to, um, you know, to, to, to deposit it. And uh, it was hidden somewhere, and they missed it. How they missed it, I have no idea. Because Sam, if you, I couldn't walk into my apartment, that's how much crap and stuff was all over the floor. They had, they opened up every drawer that I had. Every piece of clothing was on the floor. Every it, it was it was a mess. It took me it took me a week to clean everything up. So, um, but once again. Um, you know, and then, and then what they did, the other thing that, that happened right after that is I go to the gym one morning, I have an office car, it's parked in my driveway, my father's driveway. And I come back, go in, shower, shave, get ready, go out to work. And the back window of my car is completely smashed out completely. I look around, nobody else on the block has a problem with the car, bring it into the office. They bring it into the shop. I get a call from the same detective who told me about somebody wants to kill you. He calls me. He says, Mike, do you smoke? I said, what are you talking about? I said, no, I don't smoke. What do you? He said, I said, cigarettes? He goes, no, no, no. You smoke weed? I said, no, I don't. Why? He said, we found a bag. And he, holds up, he, he tells me, we found a bag. And he showed me later on. His hands were like this, filled with marijuana. Someone stuffed it into the ceiling of the car right where the window was broken. Because obviously someone was trying to to set you up because that's it's not yours and it's it's certainly not ours so that was so that was the other thing that happened and again the ta then assigns bodyguards to me they had people sitting out my outside of my father's house they used to my father was working in low manhattan he had his own business they were driving him into the office i had to put flags on the car my son's car uh license plates in case someone ran the plates you know that kind of stuff so it was a um that mouse not not a happy thing. Not no, a happy it's a cat and mouse uh, thing, yeah. and uh, yeah. I I get it. You know, I I when I when I cooperated, I, even before I cooperated, I respected uh, Frank and Maddie and people that were assigned to me. I used to see them all the time, and uh, as long as they did the right thing, you know, your job is to catch me and put me away. I'm a bad dude. My job is to get away with what I'm doing. Well, you can. as long as we could have a little mutual respect for one another, because this is going to be a cat and mouse game forever. Right. I never really had a hard on for the, you know, you know, when I was a kid a couple of times, but, uh, you know, and then when I flipped and I was with them, I mean, I had great guys, thank God, 
you know, they, they wanted everything. Because a couple of times I told them, listen, bro, sometimes you're going to love me. Sometimes you're going to hate me. Why? Because the case you got, they were telling me about a case. That's not right. Hey, uh, let me tell you what's right. You got the wrong guy. The witness is lying to you. Yeah. Come, Sammy, hey. Just tell us the truth. If, if that's not your business, whether the guy's found guilty or not, if the guy's found not guilty because of what you're telling us, it's not your problem. Just right. tell the truth. So as soon right. as they acted like that, I was more, you know, I was more friendly with them. When I yeah, first yeah. went to Quantico with them, there was one agent who tried to play games with me. He sat next to me at night when we got done, and uh, he said, Sammy, me and you are going to have secrets. We're going to have a great relationship. Secrets? Yeah. I said, I'm cooperating. I'm telling, you know, everything. What kind of secrets? Well, you know, we're going to be real close. What do you mean? Are you gay? What What do you mean? <laughs> what kind of secrets are we going to have? He said, no, no, no. I'm not gay. But they moved him away from me. He was pl trying to play good guy, good guy, bad cop. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. I would tell him on a sneak and he would go tell them, what am I, a fucking jerk? I'm the underboss of the family, bro. <laughs> I invented these games, I think, half the time. Right, so, right, right. But, but the, the rest of them were squared up. They were great. No bullshit, no games, no nothing. And I, 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 you know, me, I play. I like to play. I played with them a lot of times. You know, we'd go up a road and I would jog. And they'd follow me. They were up my ass all the time. So we went up. It was a rainy day. It was in Quantico. It was a mud trail and big puddle of water I'm running around it there in a the car following me and I know they can't get through this puddle so I go around it when I turn the curve I take off Boom. I hear the car I hear the car doors and I run down the mountain holding trees I'm flying down the, the edge of this mountain not not right. you know not too bad and I take off I'm gone they don't know where I am and I get to the road down there and I run backwards where we started this journey, right? And I'm sitting on a rock like this with my arms crossed. Yeah. They're probably going crazy. Where did he go? He's gone. Yeah. And when they turn around, probably he come back. I'm sitting on a thing. Oh, yeah. you son of a bitch. They're cursing me out. So I said, listen, what would you tell your bosses if I wasn't here? So don't get mad. Listen, I'm going to tell you what I want for lunch and get it there. But otherwise, I would tell your bosses that you really couldn't find me. I used to break their balls. I had a, I had a blast with them. But they were good guys all the time. You know, another guy time, I went to the gym with them. And it was about four or five, uh, you know, the HRT uh, teams. Yeah. They, were, they were fucking muscle-bound maniacs. They come yeah. from the yeah. military. They work out 15 times a day. Everybody's got fucking muscles coming out of their ass. So... Um, we worked out a little bit, and I want to take a steam and then a shower, and we'll, we can leave. So I want to take a steam. It's a little bullshit room. And they said, well, we got, we'll come in with you. I said, no, I, you don't have to come in. I'll sit here alone. <laughs> no, we got it. He said, all right. So I got, we're nude. We just got towels wrapped around our waist. So we go in. I'm sitting there with the towel. I open up the towel. I'm taking a steam. And the boss of them is sitting right next to me, and there's a couple of guys sitting on the higher tier. So I said, uh, what's your name? And he tells me, you know my name. He tells me his first name. No, your last name, too. Why do you want to know that? I said, because, I'm, you know, when I get out, I'm going to write a book, and uh, I'm sitting here with, you know, all these really muscled-out guys and everything like that, and really, you know, ex-military, ex whatever and and i'm so safe and so happy and uh you know and uh, i want to talk about it he says his last thing and he says uh what are you going to say in the book nothing just how what powerful guys and you know look at the size of your arms and these guys work out five times a day but i wanted your specific name because i noticed that the towel when you removed it that your dick is about two inches big and I'm going to put that in the book. He said, you cocksucker, you say that, I'll kill you. <laughs> I told the other guys, did you hear that, right? <laughs> so I got along really good with them. Yeah. You know, yeah I, I didn't have any problems. Hey, you know, you have to. I mean, if you're in that situation, that's you, you got to. Otherwise, you'd be miserable forever. You know, yeah, you yeah. really have to. You know, so really I just get along with people. I'm a people's player. I like people, so 
I get along with people. And then a lot of people, how did you transition? Like you asked me before, I transition pretty good. I like people. I'm a people's person. Yeah. Now, and uh, I'm easy to get along with, basically. I mean, I'm, I'm a pot lion. I got a bad lion side and I got a good side. I, I live with the good side with my mother and father taught me. And uh, being a good human being, like I was telling somebody, you know, I when I go to the gym, as soon as I open the door to walk out, I'm always looking back. Not because I'm scared, because I don't want to close the door in somebody's face. I leave face. it open. And then a woman will come. I'll go out of my way to open it. She comes out. She smiles. Thank you. That smile, that thank you makes me feel so good. And then when right. I come home, I look in the mirror. I feel like you were good. Yeah. That's what you're supposed to. Don't be a disrespectful Lord. little bastard or think who you are. Yeah. Be yeah. good. Do the right thing and stuff like that. So I, 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 I transitioned. I think pretty easy. I got a great team I'm working with, all good people, legitimate people. The one Anna you talk to, she went Terrific. to school. Terrific. And she's great. She went to school and she was doing a little theatrical stuff and she graduated. Then later on in life, she went back to school and uh, this year she graduates and she's just a psychologist. Terrific. And now she's working with me and she wants to stay here and she's going to go on and get her master's. But you know, so she could work with me. So she'll do it slowly. It'll take her longer to get it, but and work at the same time. So I got people like that around me, good people. Um, and it's uh, a good. It's good to have that support team. You know, that's exactly yeah. what you need. You know, and that, I got different good. people. She's Mexican. I got you know Italian people. I got an Arab woman, and she explains the Arab world, and I, I tell her, oh, 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 yeah. Yeah. and so. <laughs> You know, you got all different kinds of people around me. And I had a black guy who was working with me doing uh, um, uh, text uh, photography and stuff like that. Right. And I did something for a magazine, uh, uh, yeah, Rolling Stone, and he took the pictures. So they were going to put the picture in there. So I said, make sure you say about, you know, give him credits with the picture. So yeah, yeah. They yeah. gave him credits for that, and he just he was ecstatic. Oh, oh that's Sammy, a great thing. Thank you so much. You know, yeah. he loved it. So, that's great. Uh, yeah. Good, yeah. good, good, good. So, so it was um it was not gas pipe. It was uh, Greg Scarpa, Gregory Scarpa, and uh, Greg Scarpa. Yeah, Scarpa was was in a cell in between two of the terrorists. Um, one was um involved with um with the with the nine eleven quite frankly. And the other one, I forgot who, but both of them were involved in that same, in the, in the, in the planning of what, what turned out to be the horrific events of nine 11. And they were passing the information to each other through Scarpa Scarpa. They would, they would pass it through. And I don't remember how he, how it, it, how they he got it, but, um, but he was getting it from, let's say the guy on his left, and he would pass it to the guy on his right and it would do the same thing. But before he did that, he would make sure that he kept he wrote down what was on these notes. And there was some kind of notes. And I, I just don't remember exactly how the uh, what the passage was. There might have been some crack in the wall. I don't I just don't remember. But but he he kept all of that stuff. And at some point he contacts an attorney or an investigator who told him about what she what he had. He also had information about Timothy McVeigh, who who was going to you know who had kept the explosive explosives in in this place in uh, in a in a in a farmhouse I think in Arkansas or something. Right now so that was what Timothy McVeigh's partner. Timothy McVeigh got the death penalty, refused it. Who his partner was, and I did time with him too. Who was the partner? What was his name? He had the that's the guy with the warehouse. And uh, he was he was an orderly while I was there. And okay, he, I, I'm drawing a blank, Sam. I just don't remember. Me too, um, I don't remember his name. Terry Nichols. Nichols. Terry Nichols. Terry yeah. Nichols was there, and he was passing information and uh, through somebody, and it went to Greg Scarpa. Greg okay, so Scarpa was, was, went back to the government and told right. them about them. They right. went, yeah. They found the drugs. The only thing is that the guy they were passing the message to was a Puerto Rican guy. 
and he went to the government first. Right, okay. Right before gas pipe, uh, uh, Scarpa did. So they gave this Puerto Rican guy a big break, but not but not Scarpa. Yeah, but not Scarpa. And, and Scarpa didn't get a break at all for the for the Muslim stuff. He did not get right. a break for that at all. Right. He right. had he had the information. He and he and he told me. He said, Mike, the stuff I had was was nine eleven. I mean, that's what they were planning. And he said, and I had it, and I turned it over to the government. They didn't they didn't give him any any credit at all. For it. They caught him so, in 50 million lies, first of all. Now, I don't know if you know this part is that when I went there, I tried to get Gas Pipe to come in the yard with me. He offered me money, 25000 to go to my family if I went to them and said I lied about this, that, and the other thing. He yeah. didn't have an appeal. Right. And I told him, yes, but come in my yard. Sit under me, we'll talk. Now, through the years, I found out that he was one of the guys who killed Frankie the Chico. I had yeah. no intentions of lying or to getting the 25000 If when he came in the yard, I was going to kill him in the yard. I had promised Frankie the Chico at a coffin. I will kill everybody who did this. Gas pipe told me. Sammy Gaspipe told me the entire story. Uh, I'm when I when I went to see him, the, the, everything about, about Frank, Frank and Chico, about the bomb, how to how it was set, how he where he was, where uh, where Pate was. Um, so the and, whole you know that's happened. great hearing that. I'll tell you why. There's some one or two jerk offs, butter ass, uh, George the Chico's brother, butter ass. He was the Chico's uncle made a claim that I did it. And I said, I fucking didn't do it. I was the closest, but I didn't even, I, I didn't even argue it, but I've heard it from other guys. Now I'm hearing it from right. you that he told you the thing himself. Oh, he told so, me the whole thing. I, lo Sammy, I love it. Yeah, everything, I love it. From everything, the entire, he told yeah. me, and he told me about how the Hurry Pate's car was damaged because yeah. he, he whirled right next to the, when he, before he set the bomb off, the car then was driven to some garage. Right. We were trying to find it. I was trying to find the uh, the 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 right. you know the garage um, after we got the information. So and it took us so it took us a long time. It took me a long time to finally nail it down that it was him and Chin. Chin gave the order. Gas Correct. pipe and and the Lucchese people carried it out. So when right. I was trying to get him in the yard, I was the, where I passed the kite. The guy says, "Sammy, you're not doing this, are you? Really?" I said, "Listen, just do it." I said, he said, I know what you're doing, but then do it. Don't don't worry about uh, what I'm going to do. When he comes in the yard, and then the guy I spoke with, I don't want to say, well, was I told him, no, I'm going to take him the fuck out. Right. And I, and I mean, I, what happened? What happened? He never. I, he he couldn't get in my yard. He would have came in my yard. We would have went in. I told him where I was going to sit. I told him sit right between my legs, a little bit lower, so we, I could lean forward and we could talk. When he was going to lean forward, I was going to grab him with my left arm, rip his fucking neck open with a shank, and start stabbing him in his fucking chest until he was dead and kick him over and throw him in the thing. Now, if they shot me, because you know they're going to shoot you from the yard if they see that happening, right? And uh, that, so be it. I didn't know if I was going to get out of prison at that time anyway, but that's what the fuck I was going to do. There was another guy who took that message and knew that, and I, went, I think he went to the government. I, I, I didn't care who did what. But once I well, knew what he did. Well, you know, the, the, the woman that, that Scarp, I'm sorry, yeah, the woman that, that Gregory went to, she was an investigator. Um, he was able to get her ear. She was an investigator for Congress somehow. And um, and she, he told her about, you know, what he had in terms of the two Muslims, on the two terrorists on either side of him. Right. And she, for the, she tried her best. She was able to get a um uh the, you know the senator from Iowa this guy Grassley he was um he can, he was he listened to her and she started a whole investigation involving an FBI agent I'm not going to get into that at this point but but Greg Gregory I should say I keep saying Greg that was the father Gregory um made absolutely no didn't hide one single thing about the fact that he had in his hands 
the plans essentially, or what would have been the plans for 9-11, and the government wouldn't uh, didn't do anything for them. Nothing, nothing. And and of course we know what tragedy occurred. And uh, and you know, and you, I'm happy you tell me that you were in you were in with him at that time, so he wasn't bullshitting yeah. me about about he, where he was. Yeah, no, no, he was there, and he's out now. You know. Yeah, he is. I know. I know. I know. He got yeah. a, a a release, and he's out. And yeah, uh, but and then gas pipe died in prison. But gas, gas pipe, pipe died. Was the guy I was I was targeting him. Once I knew for sure he's the guy with the planning and the murder of uh, Frank and Chico. Chico. If he would have came in that yard, I would have tore his head up. So I'm glad he never got in that yard because if I would have did that, I would have got a life sentence on top or shot, which I didn't carry the way at that yeah. point. So I'm glad but, too. Yeah, I'm glad and, I didn't. I'm and now you I have. Didn't. Me telling you his confession about having done exactly what you you knew he did. He he absolutely right. did it, and he made no bones. He didn't even attempt to hide it. He told me he told me everything. He told me the whole story, exactly how it happened. Right. Um, All, right. So. All right. Great talking Thank to you. you. Sammy. Talk to you soon. Love you. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.